Mark Hennigas is back at the conference. We know him from past talks about several topics like tokenization and SSI. And today he will focus on why identity is so important in the metaverses. Have fun. Thank you, Marcel, for the kind introduction. And thank you all for coming to my talk, watching here in the room or watching from home. Today, I want to bring two rather young developments together, namely self-sovereign identity and the metaverse. And I would like to invite you all to join me in determining how well they might fit together. Now, obviously, um, my title is a reference to this uh, 1993 meme about identity on the internet that says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And we pretty much have to make sure when designing the metaverse that we don't incorporate the same identity flaws that we see in the internet today. And when I say the internet has an identity problem, I basically mean that it's kind of dangerous walking around in the digital world today. We see that in reports, for instance here in Europol reports, the left one saying that phishing and social engineering remain the main vectors for payment fraud or the one on the left hand saying that impersonation, identity theft, and phishing are the major social engineering fraud schemes, the major types of cyber attacks happening today. And when you look at FBI reports about cyber attacks and cyber crime, on the, what happens on the internet, you see that things like uh, phishing, impersonation, identity theft, personal data breach, these are three in the top four of problems we see in the digital world today as the internet looks today. And this is another graph, the third one, and then I stop with this, with this type of graphs, um, where we see over the last couple of years how much damage has actually been caused by cyber attacks. And what you see here on the very right is that when the pandemic hit and life became more digital, this increased by a lot. So this happens because the internet, when it was designed, was designed to connect computers. It wasn't really designed to connect people, per se. So we spend a lot of time optimizing the arrow in the middle, connecting these computers, making that secure. But the rest, where you see people connecting to these computers, we use what I want to call workarounds, basically things like passwords, what we know from the Middle Age, worked well then, has to work well today. Federated approaches like login with Facebook or login with Google. Or if we want to be really sure, we use two-factor authentication. Sometimes you might be asked for your credit card, not because you want to pay for something, but because, well, if you have a credit card, you probably have an identity and you're a person. And there's more happening here on the internet today where we use these kinds of workarounds to make sure that we know who we're talking to. Now, um, when we look at the metaverse and what it can mean, um, that is even a more a bigger space, a larger digital space, perhaps, so to speak, than the internet as we know today. If we define the metaverse as a new digital space that unites, for instance, the purely digital space, the internet as we know today, perhaps the actual physical space was moving around through the world, being connected somehow, but also the augmented or virtual reality space, and with this new space that will follow us wherever we go, at home and on the go, uh, it will be happening across industries and entity types. Um, it will be across sectors, it will be transcending geographical and cultural borders, and obviously will be shared by all users. So what we need is a high level of interoperability for hardware, software, and identity, and we have to make that a goal and a concern when designing the metaverse, because it has to work in all these different kinds of spaces, united by this all new space, digital space. And what is important is that when we use trust from one system in another, that that works, and it works securely, so identities have to be portable and secure. Now, this is a rather full slide, but I will walk you through it because this is very crucial about how self-sovereign identity as a decentralized identity framework will address this issue of identity even on the internet today, but also especially perhaps for decentralized platforms like the metaverse in the future. And what is important here is, first of all, that you see at the very top of this iceberg or triangle the applications. That's the stuff we usually focus on. That's what we want to build. But there are several layers underneath that. 
And what I'm ref referencing here is work done by the Trust Over IP Foundation and the Identity Foundation. And these layers are very, very important when it comes to designing an identity scheme that makes us build secure applications. And the self-sovereign identity framework, but also other decentralized ID frameworks, they consist of a technology stack, which you see on the left-hand side, a tech stack, interfaces, protocols, tools, but it also um, kind of calls for governance because this technology can never work just alone without any sort of governance. So we need governing authorities for each of the layers. We need certain types of roles or standards and interoperability schemes for each of the layers. So if you look at the left-hand side, at the technology side, at the very bottom, you see the decentralized identifier methods or cryptographic keys, which all contribute to the basic layer of identifiers that you can reuse and where you can cryptographically prove that that is an identifier that somehow belongs to you. And that's also where blockchain may come in, or distributed ledger technology, being used as verifiable data registries. But also on the right-hand side, or the governance framework, there are certain roles that need to be filled. So who runs this kind of infrastructure? Who is allowed to write on this blockchain or not blockchain? Who is an endorser? Who is provider of infrastructure that complements this space? And then we go um, more to the top, the second one then is communication infrastructure. So based on these identifiers, you want to make sure that you can communicate in a secure and safe way, peer-to-peer. -peer. And you need wallets for that, technology on the left-hand side, agents that do that for you, that push, push messages to you on your end device. But also you need roles like who runs this agent? Who do you trust with your wallet? Who do you trust with, your, with this agent? Who wants to be a provider? Who should be a provider there? And then we move on, now we finally come to trust tasks where you exchange verifiable credentials. So that's where the data exchange happens. So based on the identifiers and the secure communication only, then we start exchanging data. And there we need governments, enterprises, perhaps departments of enterprises, and the individuals and things that are somehow connected to this identity. And then finally, at the very top, then we can talk about building applications built on this. Then we can exchange data in a secure way. Then we have uh, perhaps to solve things like privacy on the technology side. That's when, what we address then. But then also we care about the roles of who runs a platform and how does the, the interoperability work between all these platforms. So again, this is all these four layers uh, about identity to then come to applications that are securely built based on an identity scheme that uh, is more sophisticated than what we usually use today. In a nutshell, if you want to understand what self-sovereign identity can do or what it does, you have three roles. You have an issuer of credentials, you have a holder of such credentials in the middle, and then you have a verifier of such credentials on the right-hand side. And an issuer can send a verifiable credential to a user. They then hold, manage, and control those. So these lie with the holder in their own wallet. And they can then send claims contained in these credentials, so a name or an address or something, to the verifiers. And the important thing is, which you will see at the bottom here on the left-hand side, there is no connection necessary to the issuer at the moment of verification. So there's no direct communication between verifier and issuer because the holder has the data. They send the data and they choose what to share with the verifier. This data is only stored on their device and these claims can be reused in various locations. So it's data that belongs to you and you can use it in several locations. So this is what what SSI comes with, the self-sovereign identity framework, what it comes with. And uh, to sum this up, uh, I would think that with these properties, with these qualities that self-sovereign identity has, it might be a good fit for the metaverse. It has all these decentralized components. It has a digital identity, a digital identifier layer at the bottom that is cryptographically um, provable. And it has then, um, if you, design the governance frameworks correctly. It then has standardized and interoperable layers on top of that. So looking at what it can do already and why it might be a good fit on the left-hand side, we have these decentralized identifiers. These, the ecosystem that you build atop of SSI, they are adoptable. You can build centralized trust systems, but also decentralized trust systems. 
The claims are reusable. So if you are on one platform, as we just heard in the talk before, if you play one game and you get data from there, then you can share this data with another game platform. Or um, if you want to switch banks, you walk in a, into a, a virtual reality room of one bank and you take all your data and you go to another virtual reality room of another bank and you open your account there and you just reuse all the data. So it's reusable. It's highly secure, it's PSD, uh, PSD2 compliant out of the box, usually as it is implemented today, and it is built for machine readability already. So the schemas that are usually the foundation of uh, verifiable credentials, they are machine readable, which is a huge advantage. But there's a right-hand side on the slide, which says that there are obviously still some problems to solve. Uh, you cannot just say, okay, SSI is the solution and we're going to use it to build the metaverse. Um, today, within SSI, even there, we have various standards. As I said, we need governance, and this governance might be different between different ecosystems as they are today. So we need higher standardization there. Then the question is, how do we interact with existing technology? We have trust systems in place. We have trust, trust technology in place. How do we interact with that if we build something with SSI? How do we incorporate the roles that we know today? Then there are privacy concerns, which are well known in the uh, self sovereign identity space. For instance, if I send you data, if I send you my email address as a, as a verifiable uh, credential, as a proof, um, you don't just have the email address, you have a proof as well that it's actually a valid email address, which is, well, worth way more than just a random email address. And then we have the problem of foundational versus contextual identification. So whether it's a government-issued ID or whether it's something that's only valid in a certain, uh, certain context, certain environment, and one shouldn't mix those. And it's a very dangerous thing to use your, your personal ID issued by your government wherever you go, even in places where it's not actually needed. So what I think is that the SSI framework should be considered when we design the identity layer of the metaverse. But it has to be applied carefully, and it has to be applied in close interconnection with classical approaches. So we cannot forget about what we have today. So why am I telling you this? Well, I work for a consultancy firm. I work for Define. We have our banner right there. And we have a booth outside as well. So if you want to talk about this way more, uh, a little more, then feel free to approach us at our booth. Just give you some more information uh, about the firm. Uh, as I said, European consultancy firm, and we have a, an analytical, quantitative, and technological focus. We have mostly have physicists, mathematicians as our staff, and uh, when our clients ask us to do projects, we have this holistic approach of looking at the project from the beginning to the end, so we basically design the solution together, but we also build it. We've been in the market for 20 years, and you see at the bottom uh, what our industry expertise looks like. In the blockchain space, we have this blockchain practice for, for about uh, five years, I think. Yeah, it's on the slide, yes, for about five years. Uh, and I'm a manager in this uh, blockchain practice. Uh, we have experience in several domains. Uh, there's digital assets, decentralized finance as one. There's tokenization, NFTs, DLT-based platforms and infrastructure, so basically integrating any kind of enterprise blockchain uh, platform or infrastructure, building use cases on that, also for, for private use cases. And finally, self-sovereign identity, which I've been talking, to, uh, talking about today. Um, we regularly publish on anything uh, public, uh, blockchain related uh, uh, in, in several magazines uh, or in corporations with others. And if you wish to talk more, here's my contact information. But as I said, we also have a booth outside. And I guess we have some more minutes for questions unless we want to uh, get back on track with the time. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Um, we actually have some time left for questions, if there are any. Um, we are happy to provide you with the microphones. Um, I'll also try to listen to uh, what's happening in the Telegram group, which, by the way, uh, you can use to direct your questions directly to our speakers. Are there any questions online so far? That does not seem to be the case. All right. All right. Also, none in the room currently. So, Mark? Also, take comments if you have some. Doesn't yeah, have to be a sure. question. Uh, me yes, and wonderful. Also, our speakers are always ready, keen for feedback. So, thank you very much. This was also about metaverse, and metaverse is going to be very social. So, you are going to chat a lot with people, talk a lot, and maybe even build relationships with people. So, um, do you believe that 
when it comes to identity, it really needs to be a clear name in the future. That you, like we had in Europe this, this talk about whether social networks should only show clear names, real names. Um, will that be the future for a metaverse? Otherwise, st stuff like child protection could be quite difficult. Right, thank you. I actually love this question. Uh, it's, uh, it's something I like to talk about a lot because it, it shows very nicely also what self-sovereign identity can do. You basically, well, we all don't have just one identity, right? We, we have claims that somehow describe us in a certain context. So if we want to use a social network where we know that we are there with aliases and we discuss things where we don't want to show our real name, then such a platform could exist and we can just prove that we're the same person as last time, but we don't have to show our real name. But on the other hand, we can also uh, enter other platforms where we you have to use our real name. So they might tell us to, to write things in a clear name. Um, so it really depends on what platform you are on and the, uh, th this framework. It gives you the flexibility to create several types of identity and bring to each ecosystem what you want to bring and take from each ecosystem what you want to take. So I personally believe that we still need, since you asked, I, we still need spaces where we are anonymous. We want to discuss things in a private manner and we don't want to know who the other person is perhaps even, and they shouldn't know. But then on the other hand, there are websites where I wish a lot that people would have to use their clear names because then a lot of hate speech perhaps wouldn't happen. That's my answer to that. Thank you for the great question. Great question indeed, thank you very much. If I uh, may add a semi-follow-up question on that, um, you could also make possible to make sure that, let's say for the spaces that you just mentioned, someone is over the age of 18 but still does not have to give out their real name, right? I mean, that's a very easy use case for SSI. Right, exactly. So SSI uh, supports something called zero-knowledge proofs, where you can show that you are over 18, despite the fact that your birth date is stored in the credential, you can still derive a proof that is just based on it, so that you're older than 18, for instance, uh, or just share one credential saying that you are, in fact, a defined employee, but you don't have to share your name if you don't have to. So this is all possible with SSI, and that's a wonderful use case for that, um, because uh, if I show my plastic card, my ID card today, Anyone can just turn it around and they see my address, despite the fact that they shouldn't, right? And in this new digital world, based perhaps on self-sovereign identity, that wouldn't be the case anymore. But there are other frameworks than SSI that, that make that possible as well, right? It's just, just SSI does that too. Very fair ending. Thank you very much, Mark. It was a pleasure to have you as always. And uh, yeah, on the Metaverse, nobody knows you're a dog. <laughs> <laughs>